so we, we've, we've had some um, discussions about feeling like um, isolated or like you don't belong. Or, so as a pure mathematician, I feel like I don't belong in this conference. I think <laughs> more or less every talk has been about applied math. But I found that, um, I found that people love math for different reasons. Um, um, some people really are excited by the fact that it can explain the real world or solve problems, medical issues, etc. And some of us, what we like is that it makes us um, think about things we could never have even imagined without it. It just opens up our minds to ideas that, that simply we could never have conceived of without mathematics. And that was what appealed to me. I mean, I think that's why I ended up going into um, topology, because topology had such strange ideas in it. They just really excited me. And I really liked the, um, the, that part, aspect of it and the aspect of actual problem solving, the, the, the solving a puzzle. Um, so I, I, I like the actual doing of it, and I like the way it made me think about things that, that were just beyond my conception before, as opposed to explaining real world phenomena. So, so that's what um, my, my goal today is to try and give you a little tiny peek into the, some of the strange things I think about um, that, that I find really fascinating. So that's what we're going to do. Um, I'm not going to, there's not going to be any theorems. We're just going to play with some geometries, um, the, the sort I work with in my, in my, um, in my own work. Okay. So, okay. So, um, let me tell you what I actually, it'd be nice if these, uh, how about this? Oh, now that doesn't work either. All right. Let's take this out and see if we can do without that. There we go. Um, okay, so I work in an area right now, I mean, I was trained as a topologist, but I now work in an area called geometric group theory. And what is geometric group theory? It lives sort of at the intersection of algebra and geometry, or algebra and topology. And the idea in geometric group theory is that we um, um, study, we're interested in some abstract algebraic object, usually some kind of complicated group, infinite groups, and we study them by thinking about them as symmetries of some geometric object. And then we say, by looking at the geometry, we can learn something about this abstract algebraic object. So the idea is to use techniques from geometry to understand algebraic structures. Okay? Um, so uh, what I'd like to do today is mostly just talk about the geometries themselves, um, because that's, as I said, what, what, what I find fascinating. Okay, so. Um, what do I mean by geometry? Well, we all encounter geometry in high school, and the geometry we encounter, maybe it's middle school these days, I don't even know, but anyway, the geometry we encounter in high school is the geometry of the plane. We study lines and angles and triangles, etc. but most of them, most of the time we're talking about things we can draw on, in a flat plane. All right, some of, some, uh, of you maybe went on in, in during, as an undergraduate or even a graduate student and, and studied differential geometry. And, and what do we study in differential geometry? Well, we, we study geometry on, say, surfaces or more complicated objects that aren't necessarily flat. So, for example, um, let's introduce, you know, onto our plane, let's put some mountains and valleys in there, all right, and say, okay, now what's the geometry? Well, what do we mean by geometry now? Well, the kind of questions we might ask is, what's the shortest path from point A to point B? Um, um, you know, is that shortest path, is there just, should we go up over the top of the mountain or should we go around the side? Is there more than one shortest path, um, um, et cetera. Questions, whoops, I thought I'd drawn that in. Oh, well, no, it disappeared. Anyway, questions like that about traveling around in this space, all right? Um, and differential geometry is a way of dealing with those, those kind of questions, okay? Okay, so, um, now, uh, what I, the, um, um, oh yeah, so even if you didn't take differential geometry, um, there are some geometries uh, you're very familiar with. For example, everybody understands the geometry of the sphere because we live on one. So if I say what's the best way, the most efficient way to get from here to, say, Moscow, most of you would know that we should find the great circle that goes through the, 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 two, the two cities and travel along that, and that's going to be our best our best, um, most efficient way to go. Okay, so, so the key point about these geometries and about all the geometries I'm going to be talking about today is that um, we're only allowed to travel on, 
on this object that we're working with. So actually, I'm jumping ahead. Let me just say, um, s tell you something about um, what I want to talk about is to, I'm going to make these geometries even more complicated, all right? Because the geometries you study in differential geometry, the sphere, the thing with the mountains and the valleys, they're all smooth geometries. They're all smooth. They're just sort of things flow nicely. They maybe go up and down, but they sort of have this smooth look to them. All right, what I want to talk about today is geometries that have singularities. They have points where everything goes nuts. All right, and so we're going to study what kind of nuts everything goes as they hit these points. All right, so so um, but n n nevertheless, um, um, the geometries that I'm going to study will still always my property will be I'm only allowed to travel on my surface that I'm working with. That's going to be a rule. Okay, okay, so. To introduce you to this notion of these um, singularities, geometry with singularities, we're going to play with three surfaces today. All right, And the first one, I brought some little uh, models here. The first one is the one we all um, know and love, which is just um, uh, the flat plane. I've cut out, uh, I'm, I'm working with disks, but it doesn't matter. You can imagine the disks going on forever, in which case we just have a flat plane. So the, we're going to compare. Our first one's going to be flat. We all know how that works. All right, the next one is going to be a cone. So a cone, I take my flat disk, so and I cut out a piece, and then I and then I glue and then I glue it back together in a way that it's got this funny point at the top. You know, most of it is just just looks like it was a plane, you know, no problem, but something weird is going to happen when we hit the point at the top. Okay, so that's my second one. And my third one is going to be just the opposite. I took my flat disk I slid it open, and then I inserted an extra piece. All right. So it also has one bad point. And I won't stay. I'm afraid it's been folded up for too long. But um, the the point is, I cannot make it lie flat without folding it, which I don't really want to do. Hold on. There we go. Um, so, um, but at that co at that special point, that quote unquote cone point, instead of there being less than, in, th in this one, there's less than 2 pi to go around the, you know, less than a, a, a full 360 degrees. In this one, I've made it so there's too much stuff there. The total angle around that point is more than 2 pi. All right, there's extra stuff. Okay, so some of you um, might, might um, notice that this is a little bit like hyperbolic space, except there's just sort of one weird point here. Everything else kind of is pretty flat and normal. All right. Okay. So we're going to just play with these three spaces and see what goes on. All right. Everybody got, got the pictures? All right. So I tried to draw them on here, but I'm not so good at that. So I, I figured models are better. It's really actually fun to go home and make one of these and, and, and start playing with it. Okay. So let's compare these. All right. I already told you the rule. The rule is we're only allowed to travel on the, uh, on the surface, and we call that the intrinsic geometry. All right. So for example, if I want to go across the cone, I can't go through the middle. I have to travel on the cone to, to, get, to get around. Good. So, um, so our first question, the first thing we ask, is to understand what is the shortest path between two points. That's a very basic question about any geometry. Is how I got two points, I want to know the most efficient way to get from here to here. And we call those, as they do in differential geometry, we're going to call those geodesics. Geodesics are best, shortest paths between two points. All right. So um, what's the shortest path? Well, um, OK, I'm in a flat disk. I have two points. I want the shortest path from here to here. What is it? Line. Straight line. OK, well, duh, OK. So we're OK with that. All right, um, how about the cone? OK, so here we are in the cone. And I'm going to make um, life difficult by choosing, path, choosing points on opposite sides of the cone. So I've made my cone. And I'm going to choose one point, you know, this side and the other one uh, on the opposite side. All right. Well, now I'm in this situation, kind of like my mountain. Should I go over the top? Okay, maybe. Okay, in that, in this particular um, picture, I've drawn those points pretty far down, but I could have drawn two points up near the top. Not, not so clear. Should I go up over the top? Should I go around the side? Is there more than one way to go? All right. So we, we have to think about that. Okay, but I get to cheat. I get to cheat. Namely, I could un glue my cone. I mean, I could you know, cut it back open again. And, um, um, and look, at, so the paths, I, the paths, whether I've glued it or not glued it, 
you know, the paths travel on this piece of paper, right? So, so I've just done that here. I've taken a point on one side and a point on the opposite side. And to decide which is the best way to do it, I just unglued my cone. And guess what? Now what's the shortest path? It's the straight line, right? But drawn on the cone now. So in other words, um, it, well, there it is. Yeah? There it is, OK? Notice um, a couple of things about this straight line, a couple of things about this path we get when we glue back up. The first thing is that it definitely doesn't go through the cone point. Going through the cone point would definitely be longer. And if I move those two points closer together, would it, going through the, would it help? If I had put them, if I had put them you know, up here, still on opposite sides, but way up here somewhere, would going through the cone point have been better? No, it's never going to be better. It's never going to be better. You're always better going along this diagonal. All right? So you're never going to go through the cone point. But another thing that can happen here is depending on the position of those points, if I really make them on exact opposite sides, it could well be that there's another equally good straight line that goes to the other side because, after all, this point and this point are going to get glued together. They're the same point. So I could have gone around this way or I could have gone around that way. So geodesics are not unique. They never go through the cone point, unless your end point is the cone point. Of course, the geodesic to the cone point goes to the cone point. But any, anywhere else you're trying to go, they never go through the cone point. Wait, maybe that's not obvious. Um, OK, so um, I claim it never goes through the cone point. Really? What about this guy? That, doesn't that go through the cone point? That looks like the straight line between those two points. All right, well, we have to be a little bit more careful and remember that, I mean, I claimed you just cut it open and draw a straight line. But you have to be a little more careful because that worked well because I had things on opposite sides. But now take a look at this. What if I go um, so that, what if I do the sort of perpendicular here from this point down onto here, all right? And the perpendicular from this point down onto here. Those two guys get glued together. And guess what? Those two pieces, once I've glued them together, are shorter than this one. Yeah? OK, so it's a little trickier than you think. I mean, it's not quite as, you know, it's not quite as obvious. You've got to think about this for a while. Um, but the fact is, geodesics never go through the cone point. OK, that takes a little bit, little bit of work to think about. But they never go through the cone point. OK? All right, so um, let's move on. Um, what about the hyperdisk? That's what this, this thing is called, this, this uh, oversized disk. Right? So we want to ask the same question. OK, so in order to answer this question, I find that um, it, it's useful to have another model. Some people find this in, in, um, a little easier to think about. Um, these are fun to actually you know, play with at home. But to just think about in a talk like this, here's another model of a hyperdisk. I have a corridor. And the corridor has a corner. OK, so the gray part is the floor. I'm just walking around this corner. And the blue part are the walls. Yeah? OK, but if you think about the surface, the surface of that picture I just drew here, what have we got right around this point? So it, it's basically you know, sort of normal anywhere else. But right at this point, something weird's happening. We have one, two, three, four, five right angles coming together. In other words, we have more than 360 degrees coming together at that point. That's a hyperdisk. If I just draw a little circle around that point, I'm looking at a hyperdisk. That's what I'm looking at. All right? So this is a real life thing. All right? So let's, um, there's my hyperdisk sitting right there. All right, now think about, I want to get from, say, this red dot here to one of these dots here. We'll talk about them separately. So I'm going to start here, and I want to get to one of those. And I want the shortest path. So imagine you are an ant. And you can only crawl along the floor and, and the walls, right? You can crawl. You want to crawl you know, from here to, um, oh, maybe this blue thing here, all right? And you say, OK, what's my best way to do it? Well, it's pretty clear here that you know, just traveling along the floor, there isn't much point in going up onto the wall to get to, to that point, OK? So yeah, just like the straight line there, that looks like your best bet. And it is. There isn't anything better we can do there. And actually, also up here, it's true, it's true that the, um, there's floor and wall, but it wouldn't make, in terms of 
the shortest distance, it wouldn't make any difference if I think of those as folded up or, or just flat. And it's pretty easy to see um, that the situation here is just like the situation here. If I were to lay that wall flat, just the straight line in there. OK, no problem. Now I want to get to, say, that guy. How should I go? You know, should I go like this, or like this, or like this? Any, any guesses? Through the, point. Through the point. Through the point. Indeed. I mean, it takes a little bit of um, checking, but indeed, through that point, is there really, you're really wasting time going, going around any other way. That it is indeed, again, I'm not proving anything. I'm just, you know, <laughs> but you can. It's not difficult to check that indeed through the point is actually the shortest way to any, any point between here and here. Okay. That anywhere you want to get to on this wall, you're best off going straight there and then, and then along here. And one way to see that is even though it doesn't look like it, that the, the total angle is more than pi to get me from here to any point here. It's all pi to here and then more. And same here, it's pi to here and then more. And, and that fact means I really, there's no better way. Any other way is going to cause me to bend in some way that isn't useful. So indeed, not only opposite to the cone, not only do we avoid the cone point, but in fact, lots, of, lots and lots of geodesics have to go through the cone point. A whole slew of geodesics end up going through the, the cone point. All right, so it's very, very opposite. OK? All right, so. Um, there's only, um, oh, and opposite, also opposite to the cone. In the cone, there was often more than one geodesic to get to the same place. In the hyperdisk, there's never more than one geodesic. It's always exactly one. Given two points, there's exactly one best way to get there. And often, that's through the cone point. Not always, but whenever you're in this extra, extra segment, you know, it, it's going to go through the cone point. OK, so different, very different. OK, so now let's use our knowledge to study how our universe works. So we live in one of these universes. We live on a cone, or we live on a hyperdisk. And um, we want to know, how does light behave in this universe? All right? Well, what does light do? As in the real world, we're going to imagine that light always travels along geodesics. All right? Light always takes shortest paths. So, so you shine, shine a flashlight, and the rays of light is, are always, always going to travel along these shortest paths. OK, so um, we're going to. Play a little game. We're going we're gonna to exercise our, our uh, understanding by looking at shadows. All right. So I'm going to stand on my. I'm standing on my um, in my universe, whatever it is, the flat disk or the hyper disk, whatever. I'm going to shine a flashlight, and then I'm going to put an, a little object in the way and see what kind of shadow it it it, it creates. So think of a, a sort of infinitely small little peg. I'm going to put you know peg that causes some that interrupts some ray of light. Okay. All right, well, in a flat disk, if I put a little dot at the center, a little black um, something that, that disturbs the light, um, what kind of shadow does it throw? Well, I'm thinking of it as being infinitesimally thin. So it's just going to basically throw a straight line shadow. Just going just gonna, to, OK, yes, if it's you know, whatever the width, it, it goes like this, but it's sort of zero width. And we're, we're being a little theoretical here. So it essentially just, just creates a lot. It just um, creates. It just interrupts one ray of light. Everything else just goes right past it. Yep. OK. So we get this straight line shadow. All right. OK. Um, your turn. Now we're in, um, we're going to do, uh, I guess I'm doing the hyperdisk first. All right. So I'm going to do the hyperdisk now. So I'm in, I, I'm here. All right. And I'm, go, I, and I'm shining, I'm standing at one out, the outer edge, and I'm shining a flashlight across it. And I'm going to stick a little obstruction right in the middle. So what this dotted line is is the extra part. You have to imagine. You have to imagine here that there's a whole two pi going around this way, and this is the extra sec. This is the extra piece I inserted in here. Okay, that's what I just. That's just to remind you that there's extra stuff in here beyond what the, you normally have. Okay, so now I'm going to stick a little tiny infinitesimally small obstruction in the center. And what kind of shadow is it going to throw? Anybody? The, it, remember, there are an awful lot of geodesics that pass through that one point. It's going to stop all of them, right? It's going to stop all of them. It's going to throw a shadow that's as big as that extra piece we inserted. 
right? So we have these gigantic shadows by, from infinitesimally small little obstructions, okay? Yeah, so that's, um, all right, um, what about the cone? All right, now I'm standing, here I have a cone, this one is not very good. Um, now I'm standing <laughs> at the bottom of my cone and I'm shining a light, a flashlight across it. And I'm going to put my little obstruction right at the, at the cone point and ask what kind of shadow, remember light travels on the surface, what kind of shadow does it throw? So if I were to stand, if I were to walk around the back of the cone, what would I see? You know, would I see any light or would I? No shadow at all, exactly. Um, oops, I drew it two ways. So the question is, what do I see at the back? And the point was, we already said, no geodesics pass through the cone point. I mean, they can go to the cone point, but that's it. They never go past it. Any point on the other side is reached by a geodesic that does not pass through the cone point. There is no shadow whatsoever. Okay, so we have interesting um, it, different phenomenon like this. Okay, okay um, so um, there are lots of other questions which I'm not going to go through, but, but you, know, you can keep playing with the geometry. So for example, what, uh, what you could ask what, what's the shape of triangles? Do the angles add in a plane? We know the angles always add up to, uh, um, add up to um, pi. You know, the, plane, the angles always add up to 180 degrees. Is that true in the hyperdisk, in the cone? You know, what do they look like? Well, I just drew one there. What is a triangle? By the way, what is a triangle? By my definition of a triangle is three points connected by geodesics. So I just picked three points and I connected them by the geodesics. And so that's the triangle connecting those three points, all right? Well, it's not hard to see, like in that example, that um, those angles are not going to add up to 180 degrees. And, you know, you can then ask, um, what can you say about it? What, what can you say about triangles? Um, what can you say about the sum of the angles? It turns out the sum of the angles is always less than or equal to 180 degrees in, in these kind of, so you prove things like that. So you, you can ask questions like that. You can ask, um, you can ask, oh yeah, similar triangles. Well, that's another question. Can you blow up and down triangles? Will they look the same when you blow them up and down? Um, parallel lines. I start out, well, this one's already interesting in the, in the sphere. I mean, and, it, and it's very interesting in this case. In, in the sphere, if we take two people at the equator and had them both parallel to each other, that would mean both facing the same direction, I, like, for example, north, what happens? Do they say the same distance away? No, they run into each other at the North Pole, right? They, they, they curve inward, all right? So you can ask similar questions. What happens to parallel lines? If I start two people you know, in, in this space heading in exactly the same direction, will they stay equidistant? Will they run into each other? Will, they, will, they di will their distance diverge? So all of those questions that we, that we look at in the plane, parallel lines, angles, triangles, we can ask the same questions as just things become a little weirder and more interesting, okay? Okay, so um, um, that, that was, um, you know, an introduction. Of course, the geometries I work with are even more complicated. Um, in, in, in what sense are they more complicated? Th this is very indicative of the kind of things, um, the kind of um, issues we're dealing with, is singularities. But, you know, there might be lots of singularities, not just one. I might have some kind of space with tons of singularities. And are they all of this type or this type or some of each? And what's going on? And now if I have three of these singularities and one of these, what's the shortest way from here to here? I mean, things start to get complicated, right? So you introduce um, a lot more singularities. Not only that, why stay in two dimensions? I mean, hey, <laughs> things don't all live in two dimensions. Let's put, there's an analog of singularities of this type that you can put into higher dimensions, three dimensions, four dimensions. And it has to do with whether going around the singular point has more or less than two pi, you know, is it, it, what, what, the, what the size of circle, you know, the, uh, the uh, total angles around the singular point are. And you've got a whole bunch of different singularities according to what you see, you know, how you, they're not as easy to, to, to imagine, to just make, but, but you actually can make all kinds of interesting singularities by varying um, how much, Maybe in this direction there's more than 2 pi, and in this direction there's less. I mean, you can have all kinds of interesting, interesting singularities. So, um, so, I, you know, so the, the um, spaces I work with have often many singularities. They're higher dimensional, et cetera, all right? And, and we study their geometry. 
Um, OK, are there applications of this? Well, as a pure mathematician, I'm supposed to, the answer is, who cares? <laughs> But, you know, but I was afraid, didn't want to write that on the slide because, you know, I'm for posterity. So, so actually there are applications. It's not what I do, but it's nice to know that there are some applications. And I thought um, I'd just spend a couple of minutes um, um, mentioning an example um, that, uh, from robotics where this kind of, uh, these kind of spaces actually arise. I mean, these arise in a real life situation, these kind of geometries. Um, so. Um, um, so here, here's, a, here's the robotic um, picture. I have a robot, and it's made up of lots of little teeny pieces. It's maybe a robotic hand or, or something like that. It has lots of little individual pieces, all right? And I'm interested in how I get the robot to move, to, uh, move from one shape to another shape. It's right now the hand looks like this, and I want it to look like this, all right? And I have to do that by moving a whole bunch of little pieces in succession, right? So um, to simplify, I can't draw robotic hands moving, but here's, here's our robot. Our robot simply consists of a bunch of hexagons in the plane. All right, just imagine, this is my robot. Only imagine there are maybe hundreds and thousands of these little pieces, not just, not just a couple. And um, what the allowable moves, the way the robot changes shape, is by any one of these hexagons could rotate across a vertex to a new position. So for example, Oh, I, I moved, yeah. I just wrote, uh, notice everything stayed as it was, except I rotated this one from here to here. See? Okay? So I'm allowed to rotate, all right? And so, um, uh, so I want to think about, you know, what's the best way maybe to get from this shape to this, from one shape to another shape? And if two things aren't going to run into each other, I could rotate them simultaneously. So, I, so maybe I also want to move the, the, the purple one. I want to rotate the purple one up and the green one over, yeah? Okay, so I'm going to move. I'm going to move these two. This guy to here, and this guy, th this guy up, right? Uh, and those are, those could be done simultaneously. They're not going to run into each other. It doesn't matter what order I do them in. Not only does it not matter what order I do them in, but in fact, um, I could have done them simultaneously. I could have gone straight across to here and ro rotated both of those things simultaneously. So what I do is I model this fact by um, drawing a little a little cube. And the vertices the, 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 um, of the cube represent the different shapes, the different configurations the robot can take. The edges represent rotation of a single, of a single um, piece. And the fact that the cube is filled in is a message that, you know, we don't have to go this way. We could have gone straight across and done them both simultaneously. Okay? So now, of course, I want to rotate maybe some more things, you know, or, or actually in this picture I'm going to just keep rotating the same pieces. They're not yet quite where I want them. I want to move them a little more. So what have I done? I've simply created another square that gets attached to the previous one, right? Well, let's keep going. I want to move the yellow one too. Now I've got three pieces I want to move. Luckily, they're not right next to each other or on top of each other, so there's nothing to prevent me from moving all three at the same time. So what do you suppose comes out of this? A three-dimensional cube. Right? Because I could move any of the three without, without running into each other. Okay. So, um, so, and of course, maybe there are four pieces that could move independently, or five or six. This thing is going to be higher dimensional. Because however many pieces can freely be moved without running into each other, I get a cube of that dimension. All right? Because I can move them all simultaneously. Um, okay. So the configuration space of the robot is consists of all the different, I put down a dot for every possible shape this robot can take. I put down a, a, a line, an edge, for every time I can get from one shape to another by rotating a single piece. I put down a cube whenever I can rotate two simultaneously, etc. So I put all these cubes of all these dimensions together, and what I get is a picture of all the possible, or a model, I should say, of all the possible um, shapes the robot can take and all the ways of getting from, say, this shape to this shape. Right? Gives me all the ways of getting. Okay, and now traveling in this space is precisely a set of moves that gets me from one place to another. And asking what's the shortest path from this, this, from this dot to this dot is, um, oops, uh, I probably shouldn't do that yet. Um, yeah, I'm jumping ahead. Okay, I will do that. So, so the point is it's made up of cubes. There are tons and tons and tons of these cubes. Often we'll have things like five of them coming together like we did in that corridor. We'll have singularities of all sorts. Actually, they're always, they're always this kind of singularity. 
turns out they're never this kind. So, but we have tons of these singularities in both two dimensions and higher dimensions. So we get a very interesting um, um, geometric object full of singularities. All right? And the questions about the geometry are really tell us about the robot. I mean, we want to know what the most uh, efficient way to get from here to here. That's the shortest path, guys. You know? We want the shortest path from here to here. We're answering, asking exactly the kind of questions that, that, I, that we were asking before. All right, how long, how many ways, do we have a choice of different ways of doing this? How long will it take? That's the length of the path, et cetera. All right, so these questions all, um, there are some more complex questions about, you know, maybe this robot has to perform a whole bunch of little activities, um, and maybe more of the activities require it to be in this position than in this position. What's the best shape it should take when it's waiting for its next instruction? That, that's, um, that involves finding what's called a centroid on this space. I mean, there's all kinds of interesting questions about the robot that, are re that can be reinterpreted as questions about this geometric object. Right? OK, um, it's and not actually what I do. Um, 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 this is my last slide, basically. Um, I'm interested in, as I said at the beginning, in the interaction of these things with, with algebra. So what I'm studying is group symmetries of these very complicated spaces. All right? I'm studying the symmetry groups. Um, um, I, I study the spaces themselves to understand the geometry. I then um, ask how that is reflected in, you know, what that tells me about the symmetry group. And sometimes I go the other way around. I'm given some horrible abstract algebraic object, and, which I want to understand. So I build one of these spaces on which it acts as symmetries to help me understand this, to help me understand this group. So um, there are some applications, both in mathematics and, and in, in, in other things. And, you know, but I, I just do it because it blows my mind. <laughs> and I like that. So all right, that's, that's it. Thanks. <laughs>